Allah's name, the beneficent, the merciful. And all praise belongs to Allah for giving us this ability to recognize wrong from right. And that while we have propensities to take us away from Allah, in the nafsa la ammaratun bisu illa ma rahima rabbi, yourself has this desire to deviate, has this desire to be oblivious, has this desire to be reckless, has this desire to be very self centered in a negative way. Illa ma rahima rabbi, except by the mercy of Allah. What is the rahima? Allah has given us consciousness. He has given us a fitra. He has given us ruh. As you know, ruh and nafs are actually one entity. But one doesn't change, one is fixed. The other goes through evolutionary changes. Meaning evolutionary here, social evolution, personal evolution, what we call, we change for the better, inshallah. Nafsi ammar, lawama, mutma'inna. Whereas the ruh remains intact. And Allah has made us intelligent. And Allah has given us sensors, five major ones. Sixth one being our intuition. It's the collection of the five that brings about a unique realization that you put all the sensors together to conclude in a direction. I have a hunch, you see? I have an inclination. What is it? I don't know. It's a combination of many things. So Allah has enabled us and given us all these capacities and he has enabled us to go astray but he has also enabled us with tremendous strength to remain on the right path. When Allah reveres his chosen agents in the Quran, meaning prophets, imams, the very close companions of such prophets, great personalities who were not prophets, but they were protagonists in society. They brought great results in society. They fought for truth, though they were not prophets, though they were not imams. Allah mentions them in the Quran. Luqman is a good example. When Allah gives him hikmah, وَلَقَدْ أَتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةِ We gave Luqman wisdom. Luqman was a, an African person, dark-skinned, black-skinned uh, individual. But Allah honors him so much just like Allah honors the white, the brown, the yellow. But you notice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honors people regardless of what nationality, what skin color, where they come from. For Allah has created all of them as his, in his mercy. You know, so we have created you, male, female, nations and tribes, so you know each other. And you find a person like Luqman, or you find a person in Asia, who's Oriental, or a person in the Middle East, you know. Uh, you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has endowed every human being with his gifts. And Luqman was endowed with wisdom, and we'll talk about that tonight. The advice of Luqman to his son, and that's what you and I should be studying. The foundation of all truths. How do we solve our problems? Yesterday I spoke about people who create trouble, people who are constantly stopping progress. Today we need to talk about how do we progress? How do we reach progression? How do we avoid these uh, pitfalls? How do we dodge the bullet? How do we remain steadfast and not stop and slow our progress? For time is limited. Allah has graced us with all of this. He has given us limited free will. But he has also made us weak. Allah says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ We have made mankind in a state of trepidation, constant. No matter how rich you are or how poor you are, how powerful you are or how weak you are, there's always a moment of trepidation. You don't know. That the mere fact that death looms, when Allah says, كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ Every self shall taste death. And Allah says, وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ بِأَيِّ أَرْضٍ تَمُوتٍ And no self knows on which land they will die. There's a sense of trepidation. When we mean, what do we mean by trepidation? Uncertainty. There are times you don't feel safe. It's like you're in the ocean. You don't know if the ship will sink. You're in the car. You don't know if something will hit you. 
you're on the plane, you don't know if it will crash. There's always that period, that thought, that you can never guarantee total security. We made mankind in that state. And why is that the case? And then when we go deeper into life, we live in a circle of probabilities, chance. There are roughly 8 billion human beings on earth with variant emotions. Some are happy, some are furious, and in between. There are those who are calm, and there are those who are agitated. Among our families, and among our friends and societies, and co-workers, and within our communities, people are modulating in those emotional states. And you don't know who you will cross. God forbid you're driving on the highway and you pass somebody who gets annoyed and now whips a gun out and shoots you because you annoyed him. It can happen. Road rage is very popular in the world. People kill each other for absurd reasons. So that world of probability where things can clash, where we don't know if I'm going to be the recipient of a stray bullet or somebody was shooting somebody else, but it ricocheted and hit this person and this person died. There is that whole world of probabilities. And many of us are wondering, God, why did you make such a world? It's slippery. No matter how well I stand, I can feel the earth rumbling, or I feel the slipperiness or the slope, and it seems like I just cannot secure myself. Allah says, security is only with me. Look how Allah elegantly tells us. If you reject the demigods, the false innuendos, the false, the distractions that take you away from Allah. Taghut is anything, anyone other than Allah. And you hold on to your root cause of why you exist. And your root return to the one who created you. You're holding on to a rope tight. And Allah consoles me by saying, And it doesn't break. What a security when God tells me, that you hold on to this rope and it won't break. You know, if you're hanging on a cliff, your greatest fear while hanging before being rescued is will this rope break? Trepidation. But Allah says, I put sakina into your heart. And I increase their faith upon their faith. Iman is what? Security. We translate it as, Oh, you who believe. But the actual pragmatic approach to this sentence is, Oh, you who are secure. Means, Oh, you who are secure. Security. Nothing more important in life. Security. The net result of security, peace. What is peace? Salama. Muslims meet each other. We say, Salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. We say, Salamu alaykum. And you reply, Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullah. How beautiful it is. You don't say, What's up? Yo. You don't say, How are you? How are you? you gotta put a little accent. How are you? No. Good morning. Oh, well, that's not bad. Let's see some morning that's good. Not you. How are you? I'm dying. <laughs> oh, well, in that case, I'll pray for you since you are dying. Oh, I feel great. Oh, good. <laughs> That's great. I'm happy to hear that. It's sort of convoluted, isn't it? Uh, peace be upon you. It's like, wow, who cares about the day? Who cares about your health? It's all in one shot. Assalamu alaikum. Hey, peace be upon you. Wow, you give me security. We just met. Yeah, 
And Allah says, when somebody gives you that salam, reply them with equal or better. Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatul kalam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. Islam is a religion of peace. Salama. When we pray, it brings peace. When we fast, it brings peace. We have children and adults asking, why do I need to pray? Why do I need to fast? Why do I need to obey God? Allah says, Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'inul qulub. If you do not engage in these disciplines that I've given you, Allah says, I manufactured you. I engineered you. I'm the one who knows what lies. Allah says, نَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ We are closer to you than your jugular vein. Allah knows, رَبُّكُمْ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا فِي نُفُوسِكُمْ Your Lord knows what lies in you. So when Allah is telling me, do this, do this, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, we're asking Allah, why, why, why? The manufacturer is giving you instructions on how to keep this engine and this spirit at the maximum potential. Well, we question it. Modesty. Why brothers on this side, sisters on that side? Why can't we be brushing shoulders? Sisters, why do you have to, why do I have to cover myself when I come? I've come to gain knowledge. Why? I say, well, there's a demeanor, there's a decorum, you know? When you go to work, you dress a certain way. When you go to sleep, you go dress a certain way. When you go for an interview, you dress a certain way. When you're going to present to a large audience, you dress a certain way. There's a time and a place to dress. But what better dress than the dress of modesty at all times? Even if you're in your house, even outside. For modesty is that barrier that protects the integrity of a human being. People have committed suicide because they were sexually abused. Because they felt their modesty was taken from them. So they feel unclean. And those who have abused are wicked. And they can never take it back. But the abuser now has committed something heinous and it is affected. I've seen children go astray because somebody abused them at a young age and they could never let go. No matter how intelligent they are, it just digs into their spirit and soul and they just cannot get out of it. So Allah is telling us, we have given you these injunctions for you. We've made these obligations for you. For yourself has a desire to deviate. But we guide you. Illa ma rahima rabbi. So we are gifted with scriptures, prophets, imams, and within every one of them, especially prophets and imams, we have examples in the highest forms of transactions for you and I to use as role models. That's why Allah says, Dhikru rahmati rabbika abdahu. Wadkur fil kitabi Maryam. Remember Maryam, remember Ibrahim, remember Musa. Why Allah says in the Quran, He says, we reveal these revelations, so we strengthen your heart. So we make you strong. We help you. We make you reach peace, tranquility. At the end of the day, brothers and sisters, I could have a billion dollars in my bank account and be very unstable. I haven't achieved anything anything in fact you become dangerous when a person lacks peace and they have a lot of wealth study them you will see they are usually the most destructive because now they have power in their hands and they can destroy people because they're angry but if you're calm and what we say tranquil and there is this inner peace within us whether you're rich middle class or poor mission accomplished because that's what the goal is about. Tranquility. So this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been designed for you and I to bring tranquility. So while the world is full of trials and tribulations, and as I mentioned yesterday, the troublemakers, they become a trial. Allah says, إِنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ fitna." Your wealth and your progeny and your people, people, are a trial on you. Amwalukum wa awladukum fitna. They cause trials to you. Sometimes our children go astray. Sometimes our spouses are a burden. Sometimes our parents. Sometimes our friends. Sometimes our neighbors. You'll always find somebody somewhere having an axe to grind. It's either your neighbor, 
whatever. Somebody's got some anger to release and they found somebody to release it on. Like that road rage person, because they crossed them, it was nothing illegal to pass a person, but they were looking for the slightest excuse to explode because the rage is building and they're ready to kill. Then when they end up in prison for life, then they regret. It's an irony how stupid human beings can be, but it's exactly what Allah says. Because when you forget that your objective in life is to reach peace and tranquility, instead we think money, power, you know, fame will give me peace and tranquility. I have never found a person with fame, with power, or with money, naturally because of that, to have peace. Impossible. Impossible. You cannot. In fact, money and everything else around it is a trial upon us. So we live in a world filled with possibilities of trials. Anytime we can die. We can drink water and choke. You could be eating, you choke. I witnessed, I remember as a child, I was, I was about six years old, I was at the hospital visiting somebody in Tanzania. And, I, and they had these long stairs to go up to the second floor. And I'm at the base of the stairs. I'm six years old. And a man from the Indian subcontinent is coming down. And I'm watching him. And he slipped. And he tumbled in front of me. And he came down on the floor. I went towards him. He was cold. He snapped his neck. Dead. The family came there to visit somebody. And the wife comes. And she's screaming. Children are screaming. I'm watching. I'm myself crying. I could not believe what I witnessed as a six-year-old. But Allah told me, did you see that? وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ بِأَيِّ أَرْضٍ تَمُوتٍ No self knows on which land they will die. For the next second, you're planning. You've got vacations. You've got your bank accounts. You're planning strategies to build empires on this earth. And it takes one slip and you're gone. Everything changes. The dynamics change. All the contracts you were probably going to sign, they've all now just been nullified. Potentially. Then, and they're waking this person up. And I'm watching. And for the first time I witnessed death in front of me. And it was a profound state of mind. But Allah has showed it to me many, many, many times. And the only thing that has come out of it, Allah says, did you see that? But yeah, Allah, I witnessed it. Allah says, maybe you're next. But what are you going to do about it? Are you going to waste your time? Are you going to waste your time doing dumb things? Are you going to create trouble? Are you going to find faults in people? Are you going to backbite? Are you going to spy? Are you going to be suspicious? Are you going to steal and cheat? Or are you going to straighten out yourself because any second I will take your soul? It's amazing. And how about when you meet people? Are you nice to them? Well, maybe they will die in front of you and you won't be able to say sorry. Hmm? I remember when I was about eight years old, there were a group of boys in my school. I was going to a Catholic school and they were bullying him. I've mentioned this before, I'll share it again. And they were bullying him and I was standing there paralyzed. I didn't know what to do. Eight year old, learning, feeling weak. And children, they love to get into fights unnecessarily because they're already starting to have insecurities. And shaitan has taught them, you want to be secure? The kid says, yes. Okay, go beat that boy up. Kick him. Slap him. Wrestle him down. Show him how strong you are. Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu la yaskhar qawmun min qawmin asa an yakunu khayran minhum. Wa la nisa'un min nisa'in asa an yakunna khayran minhum. Wa la talmizu anfusakum. Wa la tanabuzu bil alqab. Bi'isa al-ismu al-fusuqu ba'da al-iman. Wa man lam yatub fa ulaika hum al-dhalimun. O you who believe, let not one group look down and laugh at another group and laugh at them and bully them. Don't bully. Don't look down at others. Oh, those are people of different religion. Ha ha. 
Or you see how they pray? Or you see? Don't. لا يسخر قوم من قوم Meaning it doesn't mean for between Muslims. For the human race, one group should not laugh at another group. And women, وَلَا نِسَاءٌ مِن نِسَاءٍ عَسَى يَكُنَّ خَيْرًا مِنْهُنْ In case you women are better than the other group, do not mock the other women. Oh, look at our hijab, it's a bit torn. <laughs> or that fashion is so outdated. Or the jewelry she wears. You know, we make comments like that. Oh, she doesn't look right. We make silly comments. Allah says, La yaskhar. Don't. So I remember when they bullied this young boy, I stood there. I felt really sad. You know, almost like I wish I could jump in. But there were like four or five of them ganging up on this young, innocent boy. The reason I'm sharing that with you, with heart to heart, is to tell you one of the reasons why I'm standing in front of you. You know, from a childhood, you have these profound moments that builds your personality and shapes you. Eventually you rise to become a protagonist, hopefully, where you want to say and rule where nobody can bully anyone in our environment. We want to stop negatives. We're going to build positive institutions. We're going to promote positive messages. And we're not going to sit and stand on the sidelines weak, Wondering what are we going to do to this, to this injustice that takes place. But something that Allah touched my life at that young age, it has never left me. It bothered me, I went home. But in Africa, we go to the masjid for salah. Maghrib, Isha, Fajr, Dhuhr. Masjid is not far from us. So I get ready to go for Maghrib salah in the masjid. And as I'm entering the masjid, there is a maqsal, you know, where they wash dead persons. The door was wide open and a small little body was lying on this platform. And how Allah took me there, I still ponder. Why did I go there in that direction? Why did I look? Why did I go towards it? And why was I curious? And I approached the body and there was no one in the room. The body was lying. No one on the room. So nobody stopped me from going in. And I approached and I saw it was that same boy who was bullied. But he had gone for tonsil surgery that afternoon. He needed to go for emergency tonsils. And it failed and the boy died. And I looked at his body and so many thoughts came in my head. I said, wow. I didn't get a chance to fight for your justice. I witnessed you. But I didn't get a chance to fight for you. And I regret that. But I'm eight. But Allah also said, did you see that? Don't ever be harsh with people. For the next second I may take them away. Then you'll go to them and ask them for forgiveness. It'll be too late. So why not be nice to everyone and shake hands with everybody? And make peace between them as Islam is the religion of peace. And don't burn bridges. And be nice to them. You may be even firm. Sometimes in business we have to be firm. But people take it personal. You're attacking me. They want to, they want to break bonds. They want to attack you. Because they expect you to bow down to their principles. Allah says be principled. Be nice to them. But don't bend either way like a fig. You know like a leaf. In one direction or another. No, be firm, but be a man of peace. So to me, my life, from that time onwards, it culminated watching these instant moments of a person that can die. I said, what a precarious world. There is no security. Anything can happen at any time. But then I would ask as a teenager, God, Ya Allah, why did you create such a system? You are merciful. You are caring. You are loving. You are kind. You protect us. Why put us in this cesspool of precariousness? Then it dawned on me many years later. I see why it's there. Allah says, if I didn't do that, would you come to me? You would forget me. You would say, I don't need God. We're secure. 
Allah says, I put that so you know who your Lord is. And I make you shake. Give good news to the patient ones. When they are in that state of trepidation in trial, when they are being tested, where their life may be taken, his fear. Oh, Ya Allah, there's a flood coming. The earth is shaking. That when they have this, قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ They say we are from God and we return to God. Allah says, secure yourself there and watch. For even if death overtakes you, you are mine. We don't have that. I was in the Philippines and there was an earthquake in my hotel. In the area my hotel was experiencing. My whole room was moving. Literally a foot on each side. It was like the most uncomfortable feeling. You don't know, do I go to the safe and take my passport? Do I go into the elevator? I'm on the top floor of the hotel. Do I run down the stairs? Do I hold on to the bed? Do I hold on to the wall? Everything is moving. Allah says, إِذَا زُلْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا You think you're so secure, but when I shake it, and you think you're so proud with your stiff necks walking, you think you're something great in the world. I rattle the earth a little bit and you fall like flies. I bring water and you sink. I bring wind and you get blown away. Yet you walk haughtily on this earth like you're some, the greatest thing that ever walked this earth. We are the greatest thing that ever walked this earth. But how? With humbleness. يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْحَوْنِ وَإِذَا خَاتَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا They walk with humbleness. Allah says, now you are my servant. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. This difficulty, you wake up in the morning, you don't know who's going to be angry with you. You don't know which fight you're going to have. You don't know which letter from the attorney you're going to get today. Potential lawsuit. People are ever so willing to sue each other like this. I don't like the way you, I'm going to, I can't take my attorney, I'm going to sue you. Attorneys are like having a field day. Yes, please, 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 come. Ooh, business, right? So you find, well, litigation, arbitration, we got to go for it. Why? Why not? Wallah, you hibbul muqsiteen. God loves the peacemakers. No? Wallah, you hibbul muhsineen. God loves the good doers. No, we have an axe to grind because we're here on this earth forever. Allah says, You don't know. They will attack you from every angle. I remember history. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, wasalam, who was the shadow of Rasulullah, the protector of Rasulullah, the center of deen is Rasulullah. Rahmatulil Alameen. Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam, the day he's born, he's born in the Kaaba. When his mother Fatima bint Asad brings Amir al Mu'mineen as a baby, she hands him to the Holy Prophet. Historians say that Imam Ali alayhi salam did not open his eyes until the Prophet held him. Then he opened it and looked at him. And when the Prophet breathed his last, at the age of 63, Imam Ali salam had his eyes towards his eyes and they said the Prophet whispered in his ears and the saliva that was even coming from the Prophet's mouth was by Imam Ali hugging it. 63 years Imam Ali salam gave his life to defend, promote, protect with wisdom, with patience, with strength, unafraid in Khaybar, Amr bin Abdul in Khandak, every battle Imam Ali salam in Uhud, you see, he always was firm, unafraid. Yet people were sharpening their blades to kill him. In the dark of the night, they were looking for ways to annihilate him. Gave his whole life to Islam. You and I are not worthy of those comments. For what Ahlul Bayt have done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to promote their message. You and I, if we live a thousand years on this earth, we cannot equate to what they have done. Yet they were being attacked. They only had a handful of friends. Only a handful. Imam Ali alayhi salam holds the hand of Kumail ibn Ziyad. He says, Kumail, come with me. As they are walking down the path, he says, oh Kumail, preach to me. Preach. Give me hidayah. He says, Amir al-Mu'mineen, you are the hidayah. 
You are the wealth of knowledge. We learn from you. He says, I know, but I also love to hear from you. I love to hear what you say. This is Imam Ali alayhi salam who has to take one companion and walk and say, give me hidayah. What is he trying to say? There's hardly hidayah in town. There's hardly haq in town. There's hardly the mention of Allah in town. Zulam is constant. People are bashing, cheating, finding ways to destroy each other. Imam is wor worried what will happen to this humanity. So I cry when I read his khutbah. I cry in Najul Balagha, in Khutbah Shak Shakiya, when Imam says there is a bone stuck in my throat. I am on this camel. It is so wild, Imam says. I'm on a wild camel. This analogy, you know, Shak Shakiya is the foam that comes out of a stressed camel. When a camel is stressed, it starts giving off foam in its mouth. It's called Shak Shakiya. That's why it's khutbah shak shakir. He says, I am on this camel. He's talking about his position in the caliphate and those around him who are trying to manipulate his scenario. He says, I am on this camel. It is wild. People, society, wild. You don't know who to say what. You say one thing, they'll sue you. You say this, they'll come after you. You say that, they'll point a finger at you. He gives 63 years of his life. Allah praises him so much. Rijalun la tunhihim, tijaratun, walai bay'un, an dhikrillah, wa iqam is salati, wa ita is zakati. Never gave up his salah, never gave up his truth, always charitable. So careful that even the candle he lit when Talha and Zubair come to him, they said, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Amirul Mu'mineen, we have a matter to talk to you. In Baytul Mal, he had a camel, lit, I mean, he had a candle. He said, what is your matter, personal or state related? He said, personal. Imam dis extinguishes the that one and he lights another camel, a candle. So Talha and Zubair said to him, why did you turn that off? He says, that's state matter. This is personal matter. He said, salam alaikum. Because they were coming to ask for wasta. Like, Can you give us some more money from the treasury? He said, if you're careful with the candle, <laughs> we can't talk to you. This is the justice of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Subhanallah. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He says, I'm on this camel. It is wild. It wants to throw me off. I cry when I read this khutbah. It's short. You know why it's short? It was so powerful. The crowd couldn't handle it. So they sent him a note. Be quiet. Stop talking. Imam reads the note and he stops. Amir al-Mu'mineen. <laughs> I think about it, there was no greater man after the Prophet than him. His eloquence in speech is second to none. Yet he's being told to be quiet because he's speaking the truth. He said, if I pull the reins of this camel to subdue it, I will tear its nostrils, the nose. I will tear it and I will kill the camel. And if I let go of it, it will throw me off. What an analogy. Sometimes we live this world, we feel that camel. Ya Allah, I see that distressed camel in my life. For if I pull the reins and take control, I will tear everything. And if I let go, it will throw me. And there's this fine thing in between to manage balance. When Allah says, وَأَقِيمُ الْوَزْنَ بِالْقِسْطِ وَلَا تُخْسِرُ الْمِيزَانِ Maintain the balance. Difficult. Do you say? Don't you say. Do you see? Do you, what do you do? Do you answer? Do you remain silent? You know how much wisdom that is? Allah wants us to gain knowledge. The Prophet says, أُطْلُبِ الْعِلْمِ مِنَ الْمَهْدِ لَلَّهَدِ Acquire knowledge from the cradle to the grave. Because knowledge will strengthen you. It will seep into you. When you start acting on it, it will give you stability. It will make you honorable. The world will love you. For the Prophet has said, nothing more beautiful is possessed by a human being than their intellect and the knowledge therein and its transactions. Rasulullah, talibul ilm faridatun ala kulli muslim. 
Here, Muslim is gender neutral. Acquire knowledge. For all Muslims, it is an obligation in you to acquire knowledge. Acquire it. It's good for you. When you gain knowledge, you gain stability. And when you understand what this knowledge is about, you will see that when you pray to God, God says, I made your life difficult. Not me difficult. What it means when Allah says, What he means is that since he has allowed us free will, and he has allowed the human race to go positive and negative, any person who goes negative is going to be hell for the rest of humanity. That's the trial that Allah has allowed. So when a troublemaker comes to you and creates trouble and wants to harm you and wants to push you and wants to stop you to progress, it is not Allah who is doing that. Allah has allowed it and says, I have allowed you to do this on the condition that you bring peace and harmony, but every one of you is responsible for your deeds. Either you promote good or you forbid evil. Either you are a believer or you are a kafir. Here, kafir is willful rejection of God's mercy and we become stoppers of progress. That's what Allah wants from us. So you find this ilm, acquire knowledge. And then there are three stages. Imam Ali alayhi salam Najul Balagha says the following. Al-ilmu ala thalathati ashbar. Ida wasala ila shabr al-awwal takabbar. Wa ida wasala ila shabr al-thani tawada. Wa ida wasala ila shabr al-thalith alima أَنَّهُ لَا يَعْلَمُ شَيْئًا Three stages. Knowledge is of three stages, Imam Ali Islam says. When a person reaches the first stage, they become proud. I know. Oh, so smart. I know. That stage is the first stage. Anybody who has knowledge and they're arrogant, they're in the first stage. Imam says, when you reach the second stage, you become humble. And when you reach the third stage, you realize you know nothing. It's the third stage you and I need to be in. Because when we realize we know nothing, then for the rest of our lives, we will be gaining knowledge. And when we gain knowledge and we ponder, then Allah gives us wisdom. Allah says, يُؤْتِ الْحِكْمَةَ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَمَنْ يُؤْتَ الْحِكْمَةَ فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا We give wisdom to who we will. And whoever we have given wisdom to, we have given much good. What is wisdom? Knowing how to connect the dots. What is knowledge? The dots. If the more dots you have, the more knowledge you have. But there are people highly knowledgeable, but foolish. It's the ones who know how to connect the dots. We call them wise people, erudites. People who are connectors of the dots. People who have erudition, hikmah. They are what we call highly skilled. They take exactly what's needed and they fulfill it in the shortest amount of time. That's what you and I need to achieve. How do we get that? Read Quran. Reflect. And then ask for Allah to help us. Allah says to the Prophet, وَقُلْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي ilma," And say, the Prophet was the most knowledgeable man on earth. His knowledge traversed the universe. Universes. But yet Allah is telling him, وَقُلْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي ilma." Say, my Lord, increase my knowledge. Because the trajectory of increase is ibadah. And when we have that, we pray. We understand how to pray. So Allah says, Ad'uni astajib lakum. How would you do dua in the right way? When you and I are busy gaining knowledge. When you sit, you reflect, you talk, you question. But there's also an adab and an akhlaq on how to question when you go questioning in an arrogant way, in a condescending way, in an impatient way, in a rude way, then we have 
negated the purpose of the acquisition. We've tainted the idea of knowledge. And what knowledge should we really have? The knowledge of usul. That's why you notice we who do taqlid, we follow maraji, mujtahideen. You will find ijtihad is only in matters of furu, not in matters of usul. Because usul, you and I, which is foundational, the roots of religion, you and I must gain it without any emulation of a scholar. We can learn from them, but we make our own decisions. We learn from the Quran, from the prophets, from the imams, from the scholars, from the books, from the professors. But we become our own believers in God, in prophethood, in guidance, in leadership, and in justice and in day of judgment what we call eschatology study of the hereafter what will happen in the hereafter what am i designed for these reflections many of our community members have very shallow understanding hence they're like a tree planted with a very shallow root and a little breeze brings the tree down those who have deep roots not only are their roots highly extended long distance to receive the nutrients of the earth, but they are secure that even if there is a storm, they will not be dislodged. Ilm. So we tonight, I'm going to continue this conversation tomorrow. Dua. How do we pray? We say, God, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. It's not getting answered. There is a problem with our behavior. There's our problem with how we understand. Once you understand, you will notice that the whole system will come into fruition and clarity. Marriages are breaking. Children are going astray. Fathers are calling me. My son is becoming an atheist. He's becoming an agnostic. I don't know what to do. Rightly so, because we're not giving them the answers they need. They don't want to become atheists but they're getting frustrated, no one's talking their lingo. We're just throwing traditions at them, recycled traditions, and they're getting tired of it. And they're saying, this is not working. This is not giving me peace. I don't want this. I want something deeper. I want something more valuable. I want to be a soldier of goodness. I don't want to be fooled by stories and what we call hashed out ideas of our forefathers. I need reason. Many a parent says, son, when I was your age, I didn't question my father when he told me there's God. The son says, dad, we're living in a different world. Welcome to the reality of this world. Dad says, well, when I was young, I just followed. Now he looks good, but is he really good? See, blind following is dangerous, even if it's right. For even if it is right, if we're following blindly, then through that following, we may be destructive. It's better to question and to say, I am doing all of this. I'm not going to stop praying. I'm not going to stop fasting. I'm not going to stop believing in God, but I'm going to question it until I get certainty. And Allah says, keep struggling till you achieve certainty. In this book, there is no doubt for those who are God conscious. How did they become God conscious? They acquired knowledge. God gave them wisdom and there was a strategy and they established usul ad deen firmly. Now, when they drink something halal, haram, why? Why should I drink this? Is it allowed for me or not? Why should I dress like this? Is it allowed or not? The usul is directing you. The usul is guiding you. The usul is saying, now go study and listen to the scholars. You will see they will give you rules. When they give you rules, you have every right to question them. When I go and meet the maraja one-on-one, -on -one, I ask them, you have passed this fatwa, show me the dalil. I want proof. Am I questioning the marja? No. The marja is smiling. I'm so glad you asked. He didn't say, you are not in Bethel Kharaj. You didn't go to the house for 25 years. Like, who are you to ask me? Shoo. No. I've sat with Maharaja for hours and they're talking and they're talking and they're talking. And I would ask them difficult questions and they're answering and they're answering. I said, wow, this is the sunnah of Rasulullah. This is the sunnah of Ahlul Bayt. Who Amir al muminin said, Saluni, Saluni, Qabla an tafqiduni. Ask me, ask me for that acquisition of knowledge. Even if Malakul Maut was decreed to come and take our souls at that time, Allah says, Delay it 
for this creature, this creation of mine is seeking knowledge. Let him stay longer. This is deen. So Luqman, Allah said, وَلَقَدْ أَتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةِ We gave Luqman hikmah. What did Luqman say? وَإِذْ قَالَ لُقْمَانُ لِبْنِهِ وَهُوَ يَعِيذُهُ يَا بُنَيَّ لَا تُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّ الشِّرْكَ لَظُلْمٌ عَظِيمٌ Listen to these verses. Magnificent verses. You know when I read Surah Luqman, the 31st chapter, two things that came out from it, although the Quran is rich with so many dimensions, eternal dimensions. I have read Quran many a times and each time I read, I feel like I've read it the first time. It's an endless ocean. And 31st chapter, Allah says, Tilka ayatul kitab al hakim. These are verses from a book that is wise. Tilka ayatul kitab al hakim. This word wise resonates in its highest form. And Allah says, This is a book of wisdom. Hudan wa rahmatan lil muhsineen. It's a guidance and a mercy for good doers. I like that. I said, Ya Allah, I want this gift, wisdom. Give it to me. I will fight it till I die. Give it to me. I want it. In the same surah, Allah says, وَلَقَدْ أَتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةِ We gave Luqman wisdom. Because he wanted it. So what did Luqman say? So I looked at these two, two themes that attracted me and I fell in love with this surah. This surah is my friend. I walk, talk, I quote it often. You will listen, if you listen to my lectures, I quote often from Surah Luqman. Often. Because it's a, a real being. Imam Khomeini rahmatullahi alayhi says, on judgment day, the most magnificent creations will come in front of you and you will wish you could possess them. And you will say, who are you? You're so beautiful. That creature, that creation will look at you. He says, I'm Surah such and such. When I was on earth, if you made me your friend, I would be with you. So Imam says, make friends with these surahs. They're real. The second theme of the surah, love of parents, especially fatherhood. How to be a father. I resonated. I said, I want this. I want to learn how to be a father. I want to learn how to be this leader that Allah is exemplifying. So Luqman is advising his son. How many fathers would sit with their son? Son, come, let me give you some advice. Why are our sons running away? Why are they doing dumb things and dying on the streets? Why? This conversation is hardly there. So Luqman is saying, Ya Bunayya, La Tushrik Billah. Foundation. My son, do not associate anyone with Allah. Inna shirk this is a grievous act. Ya Bunayya. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jumps. Wa wassayna al-insana bi walidayhi. Hamalatu ummuhu wahnan ala wahnin. Wa fisaluhu fi amayni. An ishkul li wa li walidayhi. Ilayya al-masir. Parenthetical. Quran takes over. Actually Luqman is talking to his son. But Quran is presenting it. Because if Luqman says to his son, my son. God has made it obligatory upon you to be kind to me, your parent. It would be self-serving. So Allah talks. Look at the hikmah of the Quran. Luqman is talking to his son. Son, do this, do this, do this, do this. But as a parent to the child, Allah takes over and says, Parents, very important to you. Talking to the human race. Look at the beauty of the Quran, even in its flow of delivery of knowledge. That Allah honors Luqman, that Luqman should not sound like he's promoting himself. The mother suffers pain upon pain for two years. Therefore be grateful to me and to your parents. If your parents ask you to worship other than Allah, don't obey them. Follow those who are right in this matter. Your parents, obey them. It is conditional. Imams and prophets, no condition. Obey them 100%. Quran is saying. Then Allah comes back to Luqman. Ya Bunayya, aqim as-salah, wa'amur bil-ma'roof, wanha'an il-munkar, 
واصبر على ما اصابك ان ذلك من عزم الامور ولا تسئر خدك للناس ولا تمشي في الارض مرحا ان الله لا يحب كل مختال فخور واقصد في مشيك واغدد من صوتك ان انكر الاصوات لصوت الحمير can you imagine a son listening to his father talk like that my son keep prayers اقم الصلاه وامر بالمعروف do good deeds وانهى عن المنكر forbid evil واصبر على ما اصابك and be patient with the trials that will come to you indeed it is a difficult thing ان ذلك Huh? It's difficult. Father is saying, my son, you will be tested. This world is slippery. It's okay. Be patient. Hold on. It's good. And don't turn your face away from people. Don't be arrogant. You see a person coming, you turn this way. Look at humans and smile. Shake hands with them. Peace. Quran says that. لا تسأر خدك للناس. وَلَا تَمْشِي فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَا Don't walk on earth exultingly, proud, hitting the ground hard. لَا تَمْشِي فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَا God doesn't love anyone who is a show-off, who walks around telling you how educated they are and how strong they are and how many successes they have and their businesses are doing so well and what famous people they are with. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ كُلَّ مُخْتَالٍ فَخُورٍ وَاقْصِدْ فِي مَشِّكٍ Lower your demeanor. Be humble. وَغْضُدْ مِنْ صَوْتِكْ Lower your voice when you talk. Don't speak too loud. Allah says, when you speak loud like that, you sound like a donkey. Hmm? Allah is giving us advice. You find that's the parent rule. When we understand this rule, tomorrow we will talk about dua. When we raise our hands, اللَّهُمَّ إِنِّي أَسْأَلُكَ بِرَحْمَتِكَ الَّتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ when Imam Zain al-Abidin alayhi salam in his Saifa Sajjadiya وَانْتَ هِي بِنِيَّتِي لَا أَحْسَنِ النِّيَّاتِ وَبِعَمَلِي إِلَا أَحْسَنِ الْعَمَالِ Make my intention the best of intentions and make my deeds the best of deeds. There is a dua for every transaction. Allah says, now you connect the dua and watch how Allah answers you. When Allah says, ad'uni astajib lakum, ask me, I will answer you. This ayah in Surah Ghafir, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says, ask me, I will answer, is unconditional. There is no condition to when you ask. Even if you are a person who's gone astray, even an atheist, even a Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, Jew, doesn't matter. When they talk to God, Allah replies them. Ad'uni أستجب لكم وإذا سألك عبادي عني فإني قريب أجيب دعوة الداع إذا دعان I reply you don't worry but sometimes when you're asking for something it it takes time to get it do you have the patience maybe it's not good for you Allah in the Quran says عسى أن تكرهوا شيئا وهو خير لكم وعسى أن تحبوا شيئا وهو شر لكم that which you don't like could be good for you. That which you like could be bad for you. Allah says, are you not satisfied if you pray to me? Then let me give you what is best for you. We'll talk about this dua tomorrow. Tonight I conclude. Father to son. As you know, tonight is the shahada. We commemorate the shahada of Ali al-Akbar. The son, his mother was Layla. Some say she was there. The women were there for sure. Ali Akbar was 18 years of age, young. His elder brother was Imam Zain al-Abidin And you find that Ali Akbar was, had shujaat. And I told you, he looked identical to the Prophet. The young Prophet was Ali Akbar. And I want us to remember that Ali Akbar was such a beautiful child, 18. Our Imam, Ahlul Bayt, subhanAllah, their children, nurun ala nur, light upon light. Each one was magnificent. Their akhlaq, you look at Abbas, you look at Jafar, you look at Abdullah, you look at Uthman, all of them became shaheed. They were standing side by side, brother with brother, fighting against the kuffar. And they were smiling, talking about akhirah, talking about seeing the Prophet. You don't reach that stage if you don't gain knowledge. You don't reach that stage if you don't have firmness in usul. You don't reach that stage if you don't apply it. You don't reach that stage unless you understand the gravity of the message of God through the Quran. 
This is why I say to us all, you and I deserve to be among the sabiqun as sabiqun. You and I deserve to be the foremost of the foremost. That inshallah on judgment day, Allah will raise us with the ultimate human beings and tell us enter paradise. For you have struggled on this earth in your own little capacity. But you've kept away from all the distractions of the world. And you did the right thing. So Ali Akbar is traveling with his father to Karbala. Strong. You know, very strong person. And as he is riding, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, some historians say he saw creatures eating away carcass. Imam looks at that. He says, Inna lillahu inna ilayhi rajiun. Some historian says he's riding. Imam got very tired. Because you know it was sleepless. How do you sleep? You're going towards your massacre. You're going towards your destiny. Where your women will be taken prisoners. Your infant's child is going to be receiving a spear in its neck. Your son's heads will be placed on spears. How can you sleep? You will be thirsty, hungry. How? But this son is riding with his father proud. I see an 18 year old boy. Such strength. We would love to have sons like that. We would love to have daughters like that. Our daughters and sons firm, unafraid. Like Zainab, the daughter of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Firm, not afraid. You know Zainab alayhi salam, she addresses Yazid. She's in chains. Yazid is pontificating on the throne, hitting the lips of Imam Hussein's head. You know, lips, but the head was severed. She addresses him, Ya Yabna Tulaqa, O oh, you son of a freed slave. That's how firm, unafraid. Yazid was stunned. He was addressed as a son of a freed slave because his father and him were both slaves. Freed by the Prophet. Firm. Ali Akbar is riding. So Imam falls asleep. And he says, he wakes up, says, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. He says, Baba, what happened? He said, I just saw in my dream the Holy Prophet, our grandfather, calling us that soon you're going to unite with me. Soon. Ali Akbar knew as an 18 year old boy, he is going to get killed. He said, Baba, are we not on Haq? Are we not on Haq? Are we not on the truth? The father said, Bila shak, no question, we are on the truth. Then Ali Akbar smiles and says, Then let us proceed. For if that is what Allah wants from us, the way his grandfather Ismail, and Ibrahim says to him, Inni ara fil I saw in my dream I must sacrifice you. God has commanded me to sacrifice. Ismail says, If al ma tu'ma, do it. If God has decreed it, do it. If al ma tu'ma, satajidin inshallah min as God perchance will place me among the patient ones. What a father. Which father? would want to let such a son go. On the day of Ashura, historians say one of the first members of the Prophet's family in Karbala to go forward and to fight and to die was Ali Akbar. And Ali Akbar comes to his father. He says, Father, it is my time. Imam says, before you go, take permission from your mother. The women of the camp, go ask their permission. He goes in there. Which mother, which aunt, which cousin would want to let go of such a beautiful person? They were holding on to him. Ali Akbar, don't leave. For if you leave, we will be broken. Yeah, Ali Akbar. He looks at them and says, our destiny is there. We need to go. You know, historians say, that Imam Hussein alayhi salam woke up at Fajr time, woke up in the sense, prepared salah. They weren't sleeping as you know. And Imam Hussein alayhi salam tells Ali Akbar, recite adhan. You know the Fajr salah adhan 
was recited by Ali al-Akbar in Karbala. And as he's reciting, people thought the Prophet is reciting Adhan. And they were crying, even Imam Hussain alayhi salam was crying, remembering his grandfather. And he says to Ali Akbar, my son, they're going to take you away from me. But when I want to remember my grandfather, I look at you. Now you, even you will be taken from me. So Ali Akbar recites Adhan in the morning at Salat time. Historians say that the father reluctantly says, Ali Akbar, go. So he helps him alight on the horse as an 18 year old. I have a daughter. If anything happens to her, even a scratch, we all know his parents. We don't want any harm to our children. What father has the courage to place his son on a horse knowing he's not coming back? So Ali Akbar is now lightly moving with the horse going towards the enemy and he stops. He hears footsteps. He stops. He looks back. He sees Imam Hussein walking towards him. Ali Akbar says to his father, Father, we bid goodbye. Why are you walking towards me? The father looks at him, Imam Hussein. Says, oh Ali Akbar, you are not a father. When you become a father, you'll know what I'm going through right now. Letting you go. It's very, very difficult for me to let you go. But you have to go. You have to go. Ali Akbar goes, historians say, when he arrived in front of the enemy, as he is moving his horse and swinging his sword, the enemy would come near him and run. Because Ali Akbar was also known as Amr Bani Hashim. But they would come near him, they would walk away. Historians noted that they went to their superiors and said, that's the prophet. Oh my God, that's the prophet. On a horse. That's the prophet fighting us. Then they were told, you want your money? You want to get paid by the Khalifa? Then go kill him. So they jump towards him. And they fight. And they say, Ali Akbar killed many. Tens of persons, if not more. Individually, as an 18 year old. Then he came back to his father. Historians say, he came to his father. I don't know how. Regardless, the essence is true. He comes. He says, father, the thirst is overwhelming. And Imam puts his tongue on his tongue. He says, go, my son, go. Ali Akbar goes back. Now there was a man by the name of Murra, Ibn Markab. And he comes, and as Ali Akbar is fighting, he lunges a spear into his chest. And as Ali Akbar is falling, he says, Assalamu alayka, ya abata. Peace be upon you, my father, for I have been struck. He said, Murra breaks the stick where the sword, you know, where the spear is. So the blade remains in his chest. And Ali Akbar falls. Imam comes swooping towards him and holds on to him and places him on his shoulders. And Ali Akbar has his hand here. Breathing his last. He says, Baba, I see the Prophet. I see the Prophet calling me. And the father is looking at him, breathing his last. Leaving his soul. Assalamu alayka ya Abdullah. وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليكم مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنار ولا جعل الله آخر الأحد مني لزيارتكم 
السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين خصوص سيدي ومولاي يا أبا الفضل العباس وأختك زينة وبنتك رقية جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم كن لوليك حجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائي في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك توعا وتمتع فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين أما يجيب مضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما يجيب مضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما يجيب مضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين صلوات الله محمد وآل محمد